Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop today. The Unity UT21 Big D Multimeter. It's a treat especial on account of OLED display. You can see it at virtually any hangulation. Very nice, yeah? Unfortunately, here it sits in a trance. Tried to fart. And shit its pants. I hooked this up with an instrument of my own devising what for checking the chooch factor and lo and behold finger fucked by the fickle flicky finger of fate. Chooch factor zero Mr. Sulu. Look at this. Look at this right out of the box. So what's the problem exactly? Well we have it in ohms range here and we can change that to the beeper. Continuity check. Let's change, yeah. So this should be putting out one and a half volts or something in order to check for continuity. And uh, yeah, must be a blown fuse or something. Because no, worky worky. Now I decided to order this from beyond the oceans on account of it having so many features. In addition to the OLED display, you cannot buy an OLED display fluke. And even the Agilent, or the HP, or Keysight now, they're called, <laughs> musical names, uh, it's like 500 bucks, and it, it doesn't seem that skookum like I've seen guys twist the case and it, eh. So, waiting for Fluke to come out with one. In the interim, though, I figured, uh, 150 bucks, might as well get this Unity, it's got lots of features. Maybe, maybe it'll be pleasantly a surprise, just like this was. Beyond its pleasantly obscene countenance, it's also fairly skookum. Especially now I got it figured out and I know how to use the thing, I can make more vigeos. For the curious amongst us, a well brought up beer belch is 80 decibels. A proper ripper from t'other end? 80 decibels as well. Why fart and waste it when you can belch and taste it? <laughs> Let's take this A part, see what the fuck is wrong with it. First off, it's got the Mark of the Beast ETL, uh, Intertech. Just, I guess it's easier to get listing or uh, to get checked by them quicker, faster, less hassle. But it, it sure seems like the crappy tools all have that one, the Intertech listing. This is nice, this is a caged fastener. So it's threaded, but it won't come out of the basal platen here. It will come out. And I'll show you that. That's a nice feature. Oh, yeah. Ultrasonically welded insert. Very nice. Brass insert, metal insert, so you're not stripping out the threads when you're changing the baterias. This is kind of crappy, though. Like, not a single fuck given for this. Uh, I guess that's a serial number. Should have gone in here, but it doesn't look like it'll fit. Right, here's the back of the Ching, and it's got one of these... So this must be their lower grade ABS. Yeah, they do have a polycarbonate ABS blend. Uh, why the difference? Well, ABS is cheaper. It's the sewer pipe and it's got about uh, 6,000 PSI tensile strength. Polycarbonate, of course, way stronger than that. It's 10,000 PSI. Interestingly though, the blend, when you make the blend, it's less strong than either of the two. It's only got 5,000 PSI tensile strength. So why would you use a, why would you put a more expensive part, the polycarbonate, in to ABS to make it weaker? Well, it's got to do with impact resistance. ABS, the IZOD uh, brake test, the, the notched brake test where they they swing a weight and whack it over, uh, the value escapes me, but ABS is much stronger in a brake test that way than polycarbonate. Polycarbonate is more polycarbonate is more brittle. However, when you mix the two, you get the best of both worlds and you get enough rigidity to maintain strength, but you also get more ductility so that it doesn't break off as bad. It's almost got the same test results as ABS, but of course it's, it's more rigid. But in good tools we'll see PA6, which is nylon, and then GF glass fiber reinforcing either th right around 30 percent normally and this is a two-part process for molding this because this is over molded with the nitrile butylene kind of rubber compound it doesn't say what it is 
Now, I've been mistakenly, because it's got a butylene compound in there, I've been mistaken. It will not produce uh, butyric acid, that acid that makes handles stink, you know, uh, screwdriver handles. That's the acid in human vomit that makes human vomit smell so vile. That's what's stinking up your toolbox. And this actually doesn't turn into that compound. Uh, I had a chemist, I had a chemist that commented on it recently. And he said, no, 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 you got that wrong. It doesn't break down into that compound. It does break down though. I asked him, well, what is it that makes that material stink? Because there's some tools that are stinky and he, uh, I figure it must just be grease and oil and, and hand goo. Ugh. That's very lightweight. It doesn't feel like a real robust instrument, but the detent spring on the clamp is nice and stiff. And this isn't bad either. Although it's, it's a one-hander, it doesn't have any dial face. Woe betide the sinister left-handed elect chicken that's got to use this because guess what can't it's a right-handed DMM <laughs> Who would have thunk it? All right, we're in like sin and this is uh, disconcerting There's no fuse no fuses No open circuit protection at all. We have a whole bunch of metal oxide barristers here but yeah, nothing. I like to see a physical, you know, something that melts to protect you. Of course, this is cat, cat two at least. Yeah, well, it says it is cat two thousand volts, cat three six hundred volts. Now, a lot of people mistake these cat ratings for insulation ratings. They are not insulation ratings. They are ratings for if this thing fails or gets connected up in the wrong way, it doesn't blow up in your hand and give you a nickname, Stubbs McGee. Right off the hop here, follow the Hershey squirt, yeah? And there's no Hershey squirts to be seen. So we might have a slightly more insipid, uh, no, insidious, that's the word, insidious problem here. Trouble machining 101. Simplest thing first, let's check the connections. It'll come right out, I guess. Looks like they're forked connections. Yeah, they are. Some schmoo. These look good. Thought maybe from the soldering process they might have some flux, residual flux left on there. No. Okay, there's some type of hardened schmoo on there. Likely, you see that? Right back there where the contacts hit. It looks like glue, but it's probably flux, some sort of uh, flux that you don't need to clean. And apparently you do need to clean it because it's dielectric. And you can see that schmoo is all over the board. So, oh, for fuck I must. For fuck snakes, you gotta be shitting me. Fuck! Super glue to the rescue. Oh, come on. It's glued itself to the inside of the container. Ah! Oh. <laughs> if a little dab will do you, a massive gob will screw you. Whilst the glue is performing its magic, I had a little cognitive, well, a brain fart. And the reason, of course, that this does not have any input protection in the, in the way it fuses is because there's no inputs that need to be fused. These are all for, like on this uh, 12E+, plus. these are all for the physical contact ones. So. 400 milliamp fused and 10 amp fused, that's what these guys are. But this one, this one here, this multimeter doesn't have any physical connection. There's no angry pixies actually going through this on account of it's inferring the existence of angry pixies by the magnetic field that surrounds them. So this is a Hall effect sensor and that it infers how much amperage according to how strong the magnetic field is. So it doesn't need the input protection. And if we look at the topology, 
it's very very similar we have a big resistor here this is your input impedance and then we have some transient voltage suppression here far more skookum in this one than in this one but it's essentially the same thing we add a whole bunch of resistors these are surface mount devices and you might wonder why they don't just use one for the right the correct value I learned in a previous video's comments that the reason is for creepage uh, uh, isolation there's no isolation slot here but by adding these distances together they get the isolation that they need and of course and according to standards associations worldwide like the IEEE there needs to be a certain creepage distance here however we obviously don't have that especially for a cat 3 device how can they get away with that marking that well they can get away with it because there's a reach around to that they can just have it high pot tested and and if it passes the high pot testing that is a whole bunch of different D, DC pulsed and AC high pot testing that's essentially just putting in high high voltage letting it cook for a while and seeing if it flashes over if it doesn't flash over bingo bango enter tech label so that's how they get around not having the correct creepage distances here now in this one there are some MOVs uh, or transient voltage suppressors in here these are definitely MOVs because I looked them up what is a MOV it's a metal oxide varistor which is essentially a ceramic uh, between two plates a ceramic material being zinc oxide so there's grains of zinc oxide in here and it's centered in a matrix of 11 herbs and spices some other material uh, conductive material is is in there and what happens at the interface it essentially makes a diode but you have bazillions of these little grains so you end up with bazillions of diodes in here and if you put a, a diode back to back of course you get you get protection because it prevents flow of electrons in one direction unless unless the voltage overcomes that breakdown voltage and then you get zero resistance essentially it's it's, it's a closed circuit it's it's a short circuit so what happens is this is very 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 high resistance until it reaches a breakdown voltage and then it just lets all the pixies through additionally in this 12e what we see is some capacitance we have a capacitor here there's no capacitor in this side of the circuit all this all these tantalum capacitors are for uh, decoupling and, and noise suppression on the battery itself going into the ICs here now these tantalum capacitors are very much the same as these metal oxide barristers in that they're a, a centered material and they have tantalum metal and then they grow an oxide layer on top of that that tantalum oxide is a dielectric it's it's uh, very good uh, like rubber what what do they call that there's a conductor and an insulator <laughs> they don't call it insulator but it's it's they call it dielectric but it's dielectric so they have a little layer of dielectric on there and then they put in a fluid which is conductive which is a di uh, electrolytic fluid so that forms two plates of a capacitor that's how those tantalum the tantalum caps work now a capacitor if you don't understand how it works essentially if we have negative on one side and positive on the other if we have a voltage there what tends to happen is that this plate this negative plate will gather electrons on it that want to go over to the positive but you can't they can't get there because there's a dielectric in between so they build up a charge on this side consequently since this side is built up with a charge this positive side has holes where the electrons float over to try and to try and complete the circuit so what you end up with is a voltage across here and that voltage is a battery it's it's storing energy and a capacitor resists changes to voltage so it can it can store energy if there's a voltage spike the voltage goes up more electrons sit on the plate smooths it out if there's a voltage drop it it flows electrons into the circuit to prevent that try and prevent that voltage drop 
That's how a capacitor works in, in layman's terms. Now first off, starting from the input, we have these resistor surface mount resistors and these uh, transient voltage suppressors, MOVs actually. These are a CNR07D681K. Now I'm going to start naming the components, especially the ICs, because someone asked me to. I didn't think anybody cared, but people actually cared if they want to bod something together that's similar. It's nice to know what the chip is that somebody else has already used so that they don't need to start from square. You know, why reinvent the wheel? You know what I'm saying? And these are 420 volt AC nominal with a 1.1 kilovolt clamping. And they'll take 1200 amps apparently. Well, obviously not for very long. Look at the size of them. So these are what's protecting us. And the CAT2 and the CAT3 rating. So CAT2, the way I remember it, CAT2 is two, just like the prongs on a pokey bit receptacle. You're good for 120 volts, well, 240, but only 15 amps is basically what it's for. It's just for the stuff that plugs into the wall. That's CAT2. CAT3, of course, is good for, for 600 volts. I think to myself, well, that's electric motors. So it's good for electric motors. Um, that cat, this thing, that cat, uh, three, 600 volts, it's actually been tested to 6,000 volts to make sure it doesn't blow up in your hand, or they say it's been tested, whether or not it has been. And the cat two, the thousand volts that's on here, that's also coincidentally been tested to 6,000 volts, but you're only allowed 22,000 VA of power of volts, amps. I know it's not power, but apparent power and on the cat 3 you're allowed uh, 110,000 VA so it has to be able to take that momentarily without blowing up in your hand now that is a lot of power and as I said we have the tantalum caps here we have a little post for the battery again over here and these are just wiper contacts there's nothing positive you know there's no real skook and positive connection to the battery so that might give you troubles later. Here's some sort of driver for the OLED or it might be, yeah, I don't know what it is because I can't find the number. It's an H201DTA0661. And a little tip, oh, I'll, I'll, never mind. I'll do a tip video and I'll put it in there. Uh, this is just EEPROM, so this is just memory. Uh, jelly bean part probably. It's a two, T24CO2A. And then this guy is interesting here. It's a Gecko uh, EFM32 ARM Cortex 3 volt microcontroller TG842F32. So it's got 32K uh, of, of RAM of flash for running the program, but it also needs this uh, EEPROM, I guess, for BIOS or for. It's real close to the pins for the setting and adjustment here, so it probably. So it probably holds the calibration values. Here's a, a clock here. There'd be a quartz crystal in here that's resonating at a certain frequency, so we, a very specific frequency. So we give it a, a waveform that's close to that frequency and this locks it in step. And that feeds the clock for the microcontrollers here so that they know exactly when to do a cycle. Now this little guy is for Silicon Labs and it's an interesting little guy very low power uh, it's got brownout detect it's got an LCD driver pulse width modulation all sorts of I squared C all sorts of stuff uh, looks like QFN uh, or QFP 64 package might be 100 let me one two three four five six no definitely 64 pins I mean look at that it's a centimeter essentially and it's got 64 inputs and outputs. Incredible technology, I tell you, man. So this little doodad, I looked this up and it's pretty cool. You can get uh, an Arduino-esque starter kit, like a, a dev board, they call that, for this guy. And it's got, built into the dev board, it's got capacitive touch. And it's got an LCD screen. It's got buttons and stuff like that. Also has a coin cell that runs off USB or a coin cell. So I was thinking about getting one of these because it's only 30 bucks just to mess around with. But here's the problem I have. And you Pixie Wranglers, the unsubscribe button I think is probably right down here. 
go ahead and hit it. I, I don't blame you. I, I understand. I respect your decision. The problem I have is that the IDE to program it, it's not in Arduino. It has its own tool chain and it's all the fancy. It says it's simple, but it's just like, if only, that's the thing, like the MSP430 from Texas Instruments. I messed with that. That thing was awesome. Messed with it, got a dev board, downloaded the tool chain. It was gigabytes. You had to sign a non-disclosure or no, a non-export extradition treaty country thing in order to use the software for freak's sake. So I never got past it until Energia came out and that's the Arduino IDE that you can actually use that the bumble fucks like I can actually use. So that, I gotta say, you know, for, for, for getting these out in the world, if you're interested, if you build these and you want to get them out in the world, for God's sakes, do a port to the Arduino IDE. I know it sucks. I know it's for noobs, but we're out there, man. We're out there. And there's lots more guys like me. If you want to break the Atmel microchip stranglehold on the hobby market, that's what you're going to have to do. I mean, it can't be that hard to port over a compiler, right? Just a couple of ones and zeros, clickety-clack, Bob's your uncle. Further on down the line, we have the other battery tab, tantalum capacitor, some active components here, MOSFETs again. This is marked on the PCB NTC, so that is a... Negative co NCT, negative coefficient uh, thermistor. So this again is a sintered uh, ceramic material, sintered metallic, and it what it does is it changes its resistance a lot depending on a small change in temperature. So this must be some sort of compensation device. Uh, so that this thing knows what temperature the board is at or whatever this, well, it knows whatever this is at and can compensate from there. And down here looks to be a little, little tiny op amp of some sort. It's a Texas Instruments device, 50, 53Z333. And here's the input for the Hall Effect sensor. And there's the little tactile switch for... The light, the LED light, and the LED light is uh, pretty anemic, I'll show it to you. It's just a little three millimeter LED dome with the clear lens. Yeah, probably take 20 milliamps. Oh, I'd like to, you know, why, why not do it like with a nice bright light instead of a silly little. If it would ever focus. Oh, I'm sure you get the idea. One day we will be in focus. Today is not that day. All right, 40 acres, let's turn this thing around. Here's some more uh, thermistors, but these are positive coefficient. So instead of dr dropping with temperature, no. Oh, anyway, I'll leave it at positive. They do something with temperature. Big changes in resistance to temperature. There's little tactile switches here with the conductive uh, backing on the switch. This is the OLED. Nice bright. The, the good thing about OLED is even in the dark you see it because it's it's bright and at various angles you can see it. It's not like just regular old liquid crystal. There are the contacts for just contacts for the sweeps on the on the dial. There's the dial itself. And pretty nice detents. Not, not tea bag. I mean, you don't want a huge detent because you're trying to do it with your thumb anyway, like that. So, but it's nice. It's it's positive. There's a little piezo buzzer there. Beep beep. That's for checking continuity. If the meter actually works. Now, with all these thermistor devices, it's interesting to me that they don't have a setting where it's just ambient temperature. Of course, the this meter comes with a I think it's a K-type thermocouple. However, you know, it'd be nothing to coincide this reading with, with the outside temperature or the ambient temperature inside the case, at least. It'd be nice to, to know, uh, just be able to switch back and forth, you know. That'd be a nice little feature. Well, it's hanging on by the root like a rotten baby tooth, but we'll avoid eye contact and hopefully it stays together long enough to test. Well, that sucks. 
it seems to be a physical connection though because everything there's no jankiness with anything else so what we have here is a plastic boat anchor essentially yeah that's right useless at the current sense stuff should work and it's also got the non-contact uh, voltage detector here the the death stick or the chicken stick alternatively so we'll try the non-contact stuff see if see if it works anyway this is the thing how much is confidence worth right bad products crappy products inferior products that are cheaper drive out more expensive good products out of the marketplace it's just the way it goes i mean go down to the local sears and try and find a decent wrench you could 10 years ago but now you can't why is that well the good wrenches got driven out because of profit you're going to rely on this next time you get on a plane okay next time you get on a plane the guy do you want the guy who fixed the plane to have one of these or do you want him to have a meter that we're confident in and that is why things cost more money not necessarily because they're better on an individual basis, but as a whole, they are better because you have more confidence in them and you don't get one that's DOA. The thing doesn't even work. Do we trust that? I mean, for, f yeah, get your head out of your ass. First off, we're going to see if the chicken stick works here. That's the thing. I, I very rarely get shocked because if it gives me a bad feeling, you know, uh, I, I take precautions. And then if I'm in somewhere and it doesn't give me a bad feeling, I take precautions. So I never get shocked. Yeah, that's working. Sort of. Yeah, that works good. Especially considering that's, you know, that's bound together. So there should be net zero. Uh, magnetic flux there. Anyway, we got uh, we're gonna run around three amps. See what what happens. And I'll also explain to you what this where is it six thousand count thing means. What what's a count on a multimeter? Well, it's essentially how high the display can count. That's all you got to think about. So it, this can count up to six thousand. Focus you. Thank you. And I'll show you that here momentarily. We'll turn on the Poor. We're at uh, set at 3.09 amps. It's reading 2.73, which is really good because on the low end of the spectrum, it's tough, man. It's, it's tough to get in there. I think this will do up to 600 uh, DC. So, you know, that is on the very low end. All right. So this guy will only put out three amps, but uh, this ain't rocket surgery. So what we do is we recall that this is not measuring the actual amperage, it's measuring the magnetic flux of that, or the magnetic field of that current. So we can fool it into thinking there's more current by giving it more magnetic flux, more wraps, about that many. Let's see, we got, uh, we got it on zero, we're turning it on to one amp, and we can even count, I don't know how many turns that is. Oh yeah, I do, it's 25 turns. Okay, we're going to increase this by degrees here. Watch what happens when we hit 60. Ah, it has to change scale. As you can clearly see. So that is what the count means. It can count to 6,000. If it now changes scale, see? So it'll go 5999. Go completely out of focus. Mm-hmm. Goes up to 599, goes overload, and then pops over. Cheddar. Now, some might treat this as pedantic. However, the count has fuck all to do with accuracy or precision. And accuracy and precision are two entirely different things, as is count. That's essentially just how many digits it displays. Well, I wish I could show you more. Unfortunately, she's a piece of shit right off the get-go. A pretty piece of shit piece of shit nonetheless. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice. Uh, and the K-type thermocouple doesn't work neither. Son of a... Yeah. So it must be broken wire in there. Some Something's... You would think though. You know. Fuck it. It seems reasonable. I don't get it. Why? 
dead on arrival. Like it what obviously wasn't tested, like not in the least. But it does have the China export mark, which as I'm sure you're aware, negates all other markings.